Hey everyone, it's Dee Marie with Locked In and you are watching our video podcast, Breaking Bread, where we meet at the table and have meaningful conversations with those who've been affected by our justice system. Make sure to hit subscribe, like, and leave comments on the video. You can also take us on the road with you by hearing us on Anchor, Google Podcasts, as well as Spotify. Our guest today, some of the highlights that he's gonna be talking about is how he found religion while incarcerated and what it's like being a Muslim and what we can be able to do in society to not have that fear, as well as he's gonna talk about how the governor denied his border parole hearing or his release, shall I say, and how he did it on not legal purposes. And so he'll get into that, as well as what he's doing in our community now that he's been um, out of the prison system. So let's go watch his podcast. Hello and welcome to this episode of Breaking Bread. I'm Dee Marie and our very special guest with us is James. James, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Why don't you tell You're us a little bit about yourself, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your life, how you grew up, and then what you did to get incarcerated. All right. So my name is James Morrell. Uh, actually, it's pronounced Murrell, but most people, when they read it, they pronounce it Morrell. Yeah. So I get, get used to just... Uh, Going with that. Yeah. All right. Um, I was born, I was actually born and raised in Pomona, California. Right. Mm. Uh, but my family, my mother and father are my mother's family was from Banning, California. My father's family is from Palm Springs, California. And that's where I grew grew up mostly, right? Between Pomona and uh Palm Springs. Um Grew up in a very large family. In fact, I think I may have one of the biggest families in Palm Springs mm. and Banning. Uh, my mother has uh, 17 brothers and sisters. Wow. Right. Uh, the Murrows in Palm Springs is a very well-known family. You know what I'm saying? Both good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, and they are one of the biggest families in that whole region out there. Um, I grew up in, uh, playing sports. Uh, you know, a fairly uh, good kid, so to speak. Um, I'd say around 12 or 13 is where all my uh, mischievousness started to take place. Uh, I have an older brother. He was already a gang member, uh, already selling drugs, uh, heavily involved in drug activi activity. And uh, I pretty much followed his footsteps. Uh, even though he didn't want that lifestyle for me, he did everything he could to, you know, try to steer me away from it. Hmm. But at the same time, how are you going to steer me so away from something that you are yeah. so heavily involved in? Exactly. So uh, I got into the gangs probably around 13, 14 years old. Uh, by the time I was 15, uh, I was full fledged. I was already in it. Um, wasn't no talking me out of it. Wasn't no steering me away from it. Hmm. Um you know what I'm saying? I've already been in juvenile hall, you know what I'm saying, a number of occasions prior to that. And all that I did was just really just solidify myself, you know what I'm saying, in that lifestyle. Um, by the time I was 18, um, I haven't seen a full year on the street. Between 15 and 18, I didn't see a full year on the street. I was always in and out of jail mm. um, due to, you know what I'm saying, some form of violence, carrying weapons, uh, something and then by the time i was 19 i was in prison for uh 19 in life for a double murder um and i sat in prison for 25 years before being released mm. um, what was it about that gang lifestyle that attracted you um uh, so it was it was two things right so um the very first thing is is that um uh, the camaraderie, right? I just watched my brothers with his homeboys and how close knit they were, mm -hmm. right? You know what I'm saying? And I remember, you know what I'm saying, whenever one of my home whenever one of my brother's homeboys, you know what I'm saying, was, you know, at odds with his uh family members, they would always come, he would always come stay with us, 
right? And the only reason why that would happen is because how him, how close him and my brother was. So just seeing that type of camaraderie, you know what I'm saying, they all looked out for each other, you know what I'm saying? If one of them ate, all of them ate, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if one of them fought, all of them fought, right? Uh, you know, if one of them needed some clothes, some money, whatever they needed, food, right? You know what I'm saying? All of them would make sure that they, you know what I'm saying, that he had it's, that. It's like a family. Right. You know what I'm saying? So just seeing that type of camaraderie, right? And then not only that, when I was growing up, at the, the time I grew up, when I actually started really, really witnessing some of these things, you know, Crips were famous uh, back then, right? You know what I'm saying? So people used to, you know what I'm saying, call the Crips and, you know what I'm saying, tell, ask Crips to come up to the park while their children were having a birthday party and they wanted the Crips just to, you know, to make sure that nobody come in the park and do anything stupid or do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. So you either loved Crips or you hated Crips. Right. Because if you, if you loved them is because they came to your aid at some point in time. And if you hated them, it's because they was actually pushing you out of, you know what I'm saying? Uh, a particular neighborhood or, or a particular party or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Right. So just seeing that type of info, that type of power, right. Had a, very large influence on me. So I always wanted to be that. Yeah. Right. And how was your family life growing up? Was there something that was maybe missing or anything that that was why you kind of were steered more to this, this family of the mm -hmm. streets or was family great and you still were just attracted to the streets? Well, so in the beginning, mm -hmm. it was great. Right. You know what I'm saying? My, my mother and father were, you know what I'm saying, married. My mother and father were married for 17 years. Um, and our family was very close knit and then we even had cousins that stayed with us. They were like my brothers and sisters. So, you know what I'm saying? We had a, it was, it was a very good family, very tight family. Um, right around the age of 13, 14, right. Is when my mother and father, you know what I'm saying? Split up. Mm. Right. And I think that had a very large impact mm -hmm. on the decision I made to join a gang. Yeah. Yeah. So here you are 19 um, and sentenced to 19 to life for mm -hmm. a double murder. What was prison like for you? So uh, I always say that uh, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything in the world. Um, could I experience all of that, you know what I'm saying, without committing the crime that I committed? You know, probably not, but I still wouldn't trade it, right? You know what I'm saying? I, I really like the person that I am today. And I think the reason why, you know what I'm saying, I like the person I am today had a lot to do with, you know what I'm saying, what I experienced while I was in prison. And and what was that? What right? was that experience? So some of the things is, is uh, it's not all just violence, mm -hmm. right? You know what I'm saying? Even though violence is a heavy element, right? Uh, even some of like some of my first teachers in prison, they made sure that I knew how to protect myself while in prison, right? But they also knew made sure that I knew how to hurt somebody, right, when need be too, mm -hmm. right? And just you know, what I'm saying, uh, I watched older brothers in prison teach younger brothers in prison how to read and write. Uh, I watched these brothers, you know, what I'm saying, teach younger brothers. You know what I'm saying? The benefits of being an intellectual, being smart, uh, making sure that you are physically fit, right? Emotionally uh, founded, spiritually founded, right? I watch these brothers, you know what I'm saying, pretty much shape and mold us into the men that we are, mm -hmm. right? What, 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 why is there so much? Say, say violence why do you have to protect yourself in prison why is there so much turmoil inside you know you you would think that you know when somebody gets incarcerated you know it's that wake up call to like mm -hmm. okay i've been doing something wrong this is the time to not why is there always still that constant violence that's inside well so i think it's 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 more um it's, it's there are many dynamics to that Right. I think the first thing is, is just, you know what I'm saying, just uh, comes with gang, that gang lifestyle to begin with. 
Um, were you still do? Were you still a you crip still, inside? You, okay. you, you, you don't stop being a crip until you actually, you know what I'm saying, pull yourself away from that, mm. right? So, you know what I'm saying, uh, coming in already with the gang mentality, you take that in, into prison with you, mm-hmm. right? And then you are among the majority of the population who also have that same mentality. So that brings about, you know what I'm saying, a certain level of violence. Yeah. Um, and then you throw in the racial element with it, right? more violence and then you throw in a political element with it more violence and then you would throw in just the fact that you know what I'm saying you don't you are caged up and confined right you know what I'm saying you have all of this stress that goes on with that and then you know that just breathes just breathes more and more violence mm-hmm. right so then that that uh is one of the reasons why uh, the violence is just a uh, well, just a part of prison. Hmm. Yeah. Was there the re- rehabilitation the R and CDCR while you were incarcerated? That didn't come until later. That okay. didn't come until later on in my sentence. The first, I'll say, I'm gonna say the first uh, fifteen years, they they didn't have the R on the back of CDC. Hmm. Right, it was just CDC. Right, they part. I say probably about fifteen. 15 years in is when they actually, matter of fact, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the governor when they came with the R. Mm-hmm. I think I had already been in prison maybe about 12, 13 years when he became mm-hmm. uh, the governor. And so those 12, 13 years, you're still um, doing the gang life I, and everything like that. Everything you don't have that came ability. with it. Yeah. So when the R came in, was that kind of the the switching point for you where you didn't want to be a gang member anymore and no. wanted to change? How, where, so where I will say happen? this, right? CDC had nothing to do with my rehabilitation okay. at all, right? Of, of course, they offered the groups and the classes that helped me mm-hmm. rehabilitate myself, mm-hmm. right? But it was actually those brothers, those same brothers I was just talking about in prison, it's actually those same brothers mm. who, you know what I'm saying, got me to actually think a little differently. Right. I remember uh, I could recall one conversation I had with a brother. I had just gotten out the hole. I'm in Sentinella uh, State Prison. And uh, he had asked me, he's like, man, why did you, you know what I'm saying, why are you just getting out the hole? Last time I seen you, you was going down to a level three. Right. So I told him what had took place. And I explained everything that happened to him. Right. And he sat there and he listened to me for a while. Right. And then after I was done talking, man, he said, man, uh, look around you. Right. So we sitting out there on the yard. Right. And you say, man, look around you. And you say, man, we expect that. You know what I'm saying? From these dudes. Right. He said, man, but you kind of smart. Right. You know what I'm saying? We expect something different from you. Right. He said, man, you don't allow, you know what I'm saying, this prison life to be your, you know what I'm saying, your life. Right. That just changed my whole perspective of things. Mm -hmm. Right. And ever since then, I've been working to be something different, something better than what I was. Mm hmm. Right. Just that conversation right there. I wasn't expecting that conversation from him. Yeah. Right. But he was someone that knew me when I was young. When I first came into prison, he seen me actually watched me grow up in prison. And he, you know, talked to me in a way that I needed in order to uh, change my perspective, mm-hmm. change my mentality. How many years did you end up serving? 25 years. 25. Well, 24 years and nine months. Okay. Yeah. And did you um, have any, uh, and how were you, did you, was it the programming that you did um, that helped to be able to get you released or? Yes. Okay. Right. So it was two things. Uh, first thing is I uh, didn't, I stopped committing acts of violence. That was the first thing. I didn't get, I wasn't getting uh, written up. I wasn't getting no 115s. I wasn't getting uh, no 128s. Um, and at the same time, uh, I was taking groups and classes. Uh, I enrolled into the college program, got my, uh, AA degree. Um, all of those things, uh, helped me, uh, get out of prison. Hmm. Yeah. What do you feel CDCR can do better in helping prepare those that are incarcerated for society? So, so the very first thing they can do is make sure that you have all of your essentials, right? So you're going to need, uh, depending on how much time you did, right? You're going to need a ID. You're going to need a, a social security card. You know what I'm saying? You're going to need a, a, a Medi-Cal card because we don't have medical insurance, right? Certain essentials that you're going to need coming out of prison, things that I didn't have coming out and I had to go get those things. I didn't know how to do it. And mm-hmm. had I not had somebody show me how to do those things, then I would have never have gotten it or it would have took me longer to get to get those things, 
All right. So being able to have those things b- before you even get out would help someone a, a lot more mm-hmm. than having to do all those things once you actually come home, especially if you don't have nobody to help you. Right. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of brothers, you know what I'm saying, uh, come home and, you know, sometimes you know, they may not have family out here in California. They found their family may be have moved somewhere else. Or their family may not want nothing to do with them, even though they may have changed, mm-hmm. or whatever the case may be. So they may not have the support that I actually had, right? But um, I think that having that, you know, what I'm saying, would help them a lot. So now, when they come home, only thing that they would have really, really have to do is, you know, what I'm saying, make sure all of those things are activated. You know, what I'm saying, and then you can actually have a jump on, you know, what I'm saying, finding work for yourself or. You know what I'm saying? Starting your own business if that's what you want to do. Mm-hmm. All right. Your faith is very important to you. Yes. Um, did you have that faith before you went into prison no. or did you find that when you were incarcerated? I found it while I was incarcerated. And matter of fact, I found it while I was sitting in the sitting in the hole and actually in there and I'm reading. I'm I'm sitting in the cell by myself and I'm in the cell by myself for maybe about 15 months. Right. So all I'm doing is just reading mm-hmm. books. I don't have no TV, no radio. Uh, I didn't even want a TV or a radio. Now I'm doing it is just reading books, just reading books. And it dawned on me that, you know, that I was really, really at my best uh, physically and mentally. Right. Because I was able to uh, interpret books and explain them, you know what I'm saying, to my family members or explain them to, you know what I'm saying, my homeboys that I was in contact with at that time. That you know, what I'm saying, college professors couldn't even hmm. do. So I realized I was really at my best, but I just felt empty. I didn't feel right, right. So I remember reading this book uh, by Yanga Van Zandt called "Spirit of a Man," right, and that's when I knew that I was lacking uh, spiritually. So I went on this endeavor to start, you know, what I'm saying, researching and reading about different spiritual systems, uh, different religions. I studied every religion: Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism. Uh, Zoroastrianism. I studied everything, Buddhism. And then um, I even studied uh, traditional African religions, uh, traditional Native American uh, spiritual systems. And the one that appealed to me the most, the one that made the most sense to me was Islam. Mm. And that's the one I chose, you know what I'm saying, to embody Mm -hmm. within my being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So being Muslim, obviously, Mm -hmm. In American society, there's um, misconceptions. And so what are some of those misconceptions that are targeted (laughs) at Muslims? So there are a number of misconceptions. One, that we oppress women, that we hate Western society, um, that somehow that if you're not black, you can't be a Muslim. Uh, That's a a heavy one, Hmm. especially in prison. A lot of a lot of the other races in prison think that uh, Islam is a black religion. Um, mm. There are a number of misconceptions that we're all terrorists, that we're all violent, all these different things. But really, in actu- actuality, right, I didn't stop being violent until I became a Muslim, right? You know what I'm saying? I was actually putting more care, more thought, more, uh, more, integrity into, you know what I'm saying, trying to, you know what I'm saying, find a peaceful means to conflict, right? Um, I didn't really engage in any violence as a Muslim, Mm -hmm. right? And in fact, it actually helped me um, not to engage in violence, Mm -hmm. right? You know what I'm saying? Because in Islam, you know what I'm saying, violence is the last resort, right? Only time I'm allowed to be violent, right? is to defend myself, to defend others, or to defend my property, right? So, but I think that the the most common misconception that we're all violent, that we're all terrorists. Right? Have you experienced any um, backlash from being Muslim from, uh, from society? From society, no. Okay. Right, but I do know that a lot of people, even my own family, were a little skeptical Mm. Uh, about me being a uh, Muslim. Um, and it wasn't until, you know what I'm saying, they actually seen the change in my behavior that they actually, you know what I'm saying, embraced it and accepted it, embraced it, and 
know what I'm saying, and actually, you know what I'm saying, promote it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but they had to actually see, you know what I'm saying, the change in me first. Mm-hmm. Right. They they was they were skeptical as well. But that comes just from being misinformed about right. what Islam is is and what it's about. But since I've been home and been a Muslim, being a Muslim in society, I haven't experienced any uh backlash or anything like that. While I was in prison, I received a lot of backlash. Cause again, Why is that? So again, they thought that, you know what I'm saying, that I, since being a Muslim, they thought I was a radical Muslim, right? Mm. They accused me of being a, a terrorist, right? Um, and even uh, sending my file to the FBI in order to, wow. yeah, in order to uh, keep me in prison, hmm. right? Is this, so, this is the CDCR, basically, yes. is, is doing that? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So... Obviously, since nine eleven, there's been a a, a larger fear of mm-hmm. of uh, Islam and, and Muslims. What do you feel can be done to qu- squash those fears for the the people that are out in society that are just literally scared because of what happened in nine eleven and terrorism uh, and so, so forth? So the, the the only thing that's going to the quell that fear is. Uh, dialogue. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing that's going to quell that fear is dialogue. You're really getting to know and getting to understand, you know what I'm saying, who Muslims are, how they think, how they behave, mm-hmm. right? And that's only going to come through, you know what I'm saying, observation and dialogue, right? So, uh, and the reason why I say that is, is because, right, um, when this FBI agent, you know what I'm saying, come to see me when in prison, he had no clue of what type of person I was, who I was, anything like that. Right. And then after speaking with me and then after uh, actually getting a chance to, you know, what I'm saying, see what, you know, what I'm saying, what my what Islam has done for my life. Right. Uh, he was you know, what I'm saying, impressed. Right. And he told me, man, I wish you well when you go home. Right. So if if that can take place mm-hmm. with this FBI agent who in his mind, all he knows is you know, a violent criminal, Mm -hmm. you know, if that can take place, then I'm sure that, you know what I'm saying, with someone who, you know what I'm saying, the average individual just having a dialogue dialogue with that person would be beneficial and uh, would quell some of those fears that they may have. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that has to do with just being misinformed and misunderstandings. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you, how do you meet at the table? How do you have those dialogues? Like, from Christians and other other religions to mm-hmm. be able to come together and you know not only celebrate our differences but be able to understand one another. Right. How how is that? How how can we be able to start that? Well, so the first thing is is that well, first I don't I'm I never try to force those conversations, mm-hmm. right? What I do is is I do everything that I know that I'm supposed to do, right? Meaning you know what I'm saying I'm respectful, I'm kind, I'm compassionate. Right. Uh, I do all of those things. Uh, I'm compromising. Right. I'm helpful. Um, and so when people ask me, you know, what I'm saying after observing my actions for a while, when people ask me, that's when I tell them, yes, I'm a Muslim. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and then we can start this conversation. Uh, but I don't ever try to force the conversation. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that, you know, the best thing that we can do right, is just allow our actions to display to the world, you know what I'm saying, what type of people we are, mm-hmm. we, we really are. Yeah. Right? And there's even a saying, you know what I'm saying, from one of the imams, uh, Imam Jafar Sadiq al Salam, he even says that, you know what I'm saying, your dawah, meaning your, you know what I'm saying, your uh, teaching to the world, your dawah, you know what I'm saying, should come from your actions and not from your tongue. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So what he basically was telling us is, you know what I'm saying, be, you know what I'm saying, what you want other people to see yeah right be that live that you know so that's what i try to do mm-hmm. right and i allow my actions to determine you know what I'm saying, who i am at, to display who i am mm-hmm. as a person mm-hmm. yeah as somebody who's lived the the gang life you know currently mm-hmm. you know black and brown um violence or violence is rising in the black and brown communities mm-hmm. um what can be done to be able to stop that violence? Uh, so again, that's a very uh, 
that's a question that has many dynamics to it. Uh, but I will say this. Um, I think the first thing is getting to this nihilistic uh, feelings that most young people have. When I say nihilistic, so nihilism is, you know what I'm saying, when you have basically rejected any moral or any moral code, don't have any values that you think are, you know what I'm saying, uh, worth having, and you basically feel that life is, you know what I'm saying, meaningless. Um, so if you don't care about your own life, you know what I'm saying, you're not going to care about the lives of others, even those people that you say you love, mm -hmm. right? And if you don't care about your own life, you're not going to care about their lives either. So then it, it becomes easier for you to take the life of another human being, right? Um, it becomes easier for you to put yourself in harm's way when you have no love for yourself. So I think that really getting into uh, the nihilism that's so prevalent among black, black and brown uh, youth, um, until we deal with that, we always gonna have this problem of violence. So the uh, gangs, have always been there, right? You know what I'm saying? We just didn't have all of these different names for them that mm -hmm. we have today, right? Mm -hmm. But the gangs has always been there. They always been a, you know, it was like I was talking about that camaraderie, mm -hmm. right? And you so you see these groups of uh, four or five, you know what I'm saying, young men, right? They may not have, you know what I'm saying, the gang mentality per se, right? They may not have, you uh, um, a name or a moniker or anything like that. However, that camaraderie that they have, that they share with each other, that bond that they share with each other, right, has formed them into, right, that, that same thing, right? But um, they just haven't just taken on, you know what I'm saying, those names or those monikers, right? And so that's always been there. You have this desire, this just this human desire for most people who, you know what I'm saying, want to be a part of something. This is why we have organizations and this is why we have, you know what I'm saying, country clubs and whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. right? You know what I'm saying? Because people have this thing where they want to be accepted, right? Mm -hmm. They want to be a, a part of something, right? Right. So that that's never going to go away, right? But I think that we can uh, have that Right. But not necessarily have the negativity that comes with that. You know what I'm saying? Or, you know what I'm saying? When it comes to, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, the poor, you know what I'm saying? Black and brown communities. You know what I'm saying? You could still have those organizations. You could still have those, you know what I'm saying? Uh, that camaraderie, you know what I'm saying? With those in your community. Right. And all we'd have to do now is just figure out a way to take away, you know what I'm saying? That self hatred. Right. Or that nihilistic behavior that comes, you know, what I'm saying we're just being in in those ghettos. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you feel like society has kind of molded it to be that way? I feel way that society that has played. I feel that society has played a major role in that. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, they continue to play a major role in that to a point to where they even uh, celebrate or uh, um, to what I'm looking for where they actually promote, mm. you know what I'm saying, that type of behavior, mm -hmm. right? You hear it, or you see it in the movies, you hear it in the music, right? where, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, they, it's, they promote this yeah. type of behavior, mm -hmm. right? And also they can make money off of it, mm. right? You know what I mean? So I think that society has played a role in that. I think that politicians, right, haven't done anything in order to help stop that. And the reason why is because two reasons. They don't care and... It doesn't fill their pockets. Yeah, it's money maker. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. Uh, so how do we then as a community, see, knowing this, that this has been something that's a structure that's been developed in, mm -hmm. in our American culture, how do we shift that to make it better right. to be able to level up so that you're th that the black and brown communities are not in the ghettos and that right. they have you know a better area to be able to see that their life there's more to life than just gangs or this right. that and the other so i think that uh so first of all you want to be able to uh so thing i learned in psychology is maslow's hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. right so Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the very first thing that you have to take care of is those basic needs, right? Food, yeah. shelter, clothing, 
safety. Right, yeah. safety. Mm-hmm. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that's the very first thing we have to deal with because no one's going to listen to you until those things are actually met. Mm-hmm. Right. And after we meet those things, you know what I mean? The only way we're going to meet those things is by generating our own wealth. Right. Um, and the only way we're going to be able to generate our own wealth is, you know what I'm saying, through some form of business, uh, financial literacy, you know what I mean? Things like that. Right. Um, but once we meet those needs, then we can start getting into uh, other things that may, you know what I'm saying, contribute to lessening, right, uh, the violence per se, right? Because I really don't, I really don't think that we're just going to end, just, just stop, you know what I'm saying, people from being in gangs. Mm-hmm. I really don't think that that's going to happen. But what we, the activity that takes place in gangs, I think that we can limit that you know what I'm saying and bring that down a notch mm-hmm. right I think that that can happen mm. right and you see it today right you know what I'm saying with today's uh motorcycle uh, club there are more motorcycle clubs now than ever right but then that goes back to that want to be a part of something right right but then motorcycle clubs are known for you know what I'm saying their community outreach mm-hmm. right they're known for you know what I'm saying their uh legal status Right. They're known for a number of things that are very positive in the community as opposed to uh, what gang members are have become known for. Yeah. It's right. like switching that to be able to right. still be able to quote unquote, have a gang and have that family camaraderie, but right. just doing it not towards violence. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And then more, you know, what I'm saying community based uh, help. Right. You know what I'm saying? Making sure that the community is safe, making sure that the community needs are being met. Mm-hmm. Right? You know what I'm saying? I think that, you know what I'm saying, uh, the gangs have gotten away from that. Mm-hmm. Right? Where in the past, it used to be that way. Where, you know what I'm saying, they would, you know what I'm saying, make sure. Like, I you're, remember, like you were saying, the park, they yeah, would be, be, yeah. be called for that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? So I remember too, right, when growing up, where, you know what I'm saying, my older homies, we, we want to go to the movies or we want to go to a football game or wherever the case may be. And they used to give us money and, and you know what I'm saying, and give us rides just to make sure that we got down there safe. Hmm. Right. And we just don't see that no more. You know what I mean? You know, so. And why why do you think that is? I think that, uh, like I say, you know what I'm saying, the, the nihilism has taking a hold not only of the younger generation, but also the other older generation who feel that, you know what I'm saying, the younger generation can't be talked to, hmm. right? Interesting. You know I mean? um, but who's trying to, right? Do you think it's also resources have gone out of those communities, that there aren't the resources there anymore? Uh, I would, that, that's definitely part of it, yes. Okay. I would agree with that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, resources, hmm. yeah. As an an activist, what is something that you would want other cultures to be aware of? A black activist mm-hmm. to be aware of, um, and where what areas that you think that they can be able to help? Well, the, the very first thing is is recognizing that you know what I'm saying that we all want the same thing, right? You know what I'm saying. So just like I was talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we all want our needs to be met, mm-hmm. right? You know what I'm saying, um, and we just like any other human being, right? We we just want our needs to be met. That's the very first thing. The second thing is is that uh, my blackness, or you know, what I'm saying what I hold on to, you know, what I'm saying what I take pride in, right, is not necessarily, you know, what I'm saying in opposition to other races and other cultures, mm-hmm. right. Uh, in fact, I, I was just talking to uh, one of my uh, supervisors at work, and I was telling him, you know, what I'm saying that you know, the more I learned about myself, the less conflict I had with other people, right? The more, you know, what I'm saying uh, history I learned, you know, what I'm saying about African American history and about African history in general, right? The more I learned about that stuff, it pulled me away from, you know, what I'm saying that gang lifestyle as well, right? So. Uh, and then, you know what I'm saying, the more, you know what I'm saying, I learned about myself, the more I wanted to learn about others, right? So, you know what I'm saying, it's not necessarily just because, you know what I'm saying, I hold on to it and you see, you know what I'm saying, the, the Kufi and the Muslim garb and, you know what I'm saying, the African uh, garb and things like that. It doesn't necessarily put me in opposition to mm-hmm. other cultures, right? And in fact, you know what I'm saying, it actually helps me embrace other cultures, right? But because, it's also celebrating you and the culture yes. that you're proud of as well, yes. too. Yes. So, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
since um, getting out of, of prison, what have you been doing now in society? So right now, I uh, I, just, I work as an alcohol and drug counselor. Um, that's one of the best decisions I ever made. Mm. Right? I there is not. I wouldn't. There's nothing else I'd rather be doing. I actually really enjoy what I do. Mm. Right? I like the people that I work with. You know, what I'm saying I have a great supervisor. Right? Uh, he's a very good teacher as well. Um, and then there. Other things that I would like to do in my own community, I just haven't had the opportunity to do so. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know what type of pushback I'm going to receive, right? And unfortunately, I think that a lot of the pushback is not going to come from the people in the community. I think it's going to come from the city, mm. right? So, but what are some things that you're wanting to do that you feel you're going to have pushback on? Well, so one of my well, one of my little cousins, he is the director and the coordinator at the park in our community, right? And I was telling him about some of the ideas that I have, right? Especially in dealing with, you know, I'm saying the younger generation who, who are still involved in the gangs and the drugs and things like that. So I was telling him about some of the ideas that I have, right? And so the very first thing that he had told me was, was that, man, you know, I'm saying the city is not going to give us money for that. Right. I said, so I told him, I said, man, um, you know what I'm saying? If we do this the way that I think that we can do it, we won't even need the money mm. from the city. Right. And then that's when it dawned on me that, you know what I'm saying? Once they get wind of what we're trying to do, then that's when we try to, that's when we get the pushback. Um, but the, one of the things I wanted to do was just, I remember growing up, they had these uh, camping trips, fishing trips. Uh, all these different things, you know what I'm saying, with the older guy who was running the park at that time, right? You know what I'm saying? His name was James as well, right? And they had fishing with James, lunch with James, right? They had all of those things, mm -hmm. right, when we was growing up, right? And those things, you know what I'm saying, actually helped a lot of the young guys in our community, right? To do something and kind of stay out of trouble, but to do something yeah. else. So yeah. you could still be a part of that community yeah. without necessarily having to go towards, you know what I'm saying, the negativity, yeah. right? And, I, it, and it helped. A lot of those, a lot of the guys that he used to take on those trips, right, uh, they end up, you know what I'm saying, going a different way. My little cousin being one of them, mm. right? Mm. You know, at one point in time when he was younger, he you know what I'm saying, was headed in the wrong direction, right? We got a little tutelage from older guys in our community. He went a totally different direction. If you see him now, you would never have guessed that he was, you know what I'm saying, headed that, that you know, down the wrong path, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there are a number of guys in our community just like that. And it's unfortunate, you know what I'm saying, that the, the older guy that I'm talking about, uh, James, he lost his life actually saving one of the guys life, you know what I'm saying, at the Colorado River. Mm. Right. So, you know what I'm saying, just being able and seeing this young man, you know what I'm saying, do things with his life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's just there are things that we can do that we don't need. You Absolutely. Know you know, Absolutely. the city's help in doing that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So drug and alcohol counseling, did you get that while you were incarcerated or did you get that? I got that out? while I was incarcerated. Okay. Right. It's called the OMCP program, right? Offender uh, Mentor uh, Certification Program. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why they called it that, right, is because the COs, the correctional officers, didn't want us to be called counselors, right? Mm -hmm. So they came with that Offender Mentor Certification Program, right? Interesting. And, right. So- so what made you want to go into drug and alcohol counseling? Uh, there was a counselor there uh, by the name of Mr. Edelman. Um, he had told me, he was like, man, you know what I'm saying? You should uh, put your application in for the OMCP program. I told him, like, man, I already, I already did that. I'm not going to do that again. You know what I'm saying? They shot me down. Why did they, they shoot you down? Was, they shot me down because uh, I had just been found suitable for parole. And... Uh, I was on my way home, so they was like, no, right? But then the governor snatched my date, um, and two years later, this, I'm having this conversation with Mr. Edelman, and he was like, man, put your application in again, mm. right? So I'm like, man, why? Why would I do that, right? He was like, man, I think you'll be a good counselor, right? And so I was like, okay, I, I'll try it. And I put my application in again, and uh, they 
the OMCP program get over 5,000 applications a year, mm. right? Uh, they're only going to choose 32 in our group, right? And I was one of those 32, mm. right? Yeah. And then learning that curriculum, you're just like, yeah, this yeah. is definitely uh, for yeah. me. Yeah, a fourteen month curriculum. We had some of the best teachers that we can ha actually have. Um, we had a, a supervisor. His name was Tom. Tom Gorham. He, you know, he he was something else, right? <laughs> he was, yeah, he was something else. But he was very, very good, very instrumental, and very instrumental in some of the work that I actually do now. Hmm. So, yeah. Now I'm I'm intrigued. You had said that you um, put your application in, but your date was snatched. So, what mm -hmm. happened? So you actually got set, found suitable from the board, right? But the governor took it away. Yes. So what was his reason? Who? Which governor was it? And what was his reason? Governor Brown for taking taking it away. Yeah. So a lot of people don't know, but it was Governor Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, so he had. So well, I would say this. Uh, I went in front of the board in 2000 and. 13, no, 2012, right? I went in front of the board 2012. I get a three-year denial, right? Um, at the end of 2013, right around, I say right around October, November, um, I get a notice that I was going to be going back in front of the board early, hmm. right? So in March of 2014, I go back in front of the board uh, we go in there, we sit in front of that panel for almost six hours. Wow. Right. It was almost six hours. Uh, as a matter of fact, I remember going over there uh, at two. I didn't get back to the yard till nine o'clock that night. All right. So, um, but I was found suitable and um, it was the best feeling ever. Right. And then I say... So that was in March, August of that same year. I get the notice in the mail that the governor, you know, what I'm saying has uh, recent took back uh, rescinded the board's decision and is not going to grant me parole. Did he say why? He gave four reasons why. Right, um, all four reasons are against the law. Wow. Case law that's already said. The very first reason he gave was he said that um, that he talked about the heinousness. And the callousness of the crime itself, okay. right? Now, the reason why, you know what I'm saying, that's not a means of denying parole is because there's nothing I can do about that. It's a fixed that. point. There's nothing I could change that that will always be that. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, and there's actually case law yes, talking about that, exactly. right? Um, the second reason he gave, he said that most of my self-help was fairly recent. Now, I don't know what fairly recent means. Right. But that's what he said. So now, mind also, you. also, R didn't come into the fact. So. So now, mind you, that I started really beginning my self-help around 2008. Now, this is 2014. So how what's fairly recent. Right. Right. It's been six years. And I had a number of groups and classes and things like that, along with the college degrees. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't understand that. But they got case law stating that. Again, right, fairly recent doesn't mean, you know what I'm saying, that he doesn't have it. And it doesn't apply. Right, I exactly. Mean, I still right? that's still six years of knowledge that I've gained. Right. So So the third reason he gave, he said that uh I had a moderate on my psych report. Right. Again, you know what I mean? Case law is stating that, you know what I'm saying, uh a moderate. You know what I'm saying? Does it mean that I'm going to get out and commit more crime? In fact, it means the opposite of that. Yeah. Right? And then the last reason he gave, uh, what was the last reason? Um, oh, he said that I had a rudimentary understanding of the 12 steps. Right? Again, there hmm. are case laws stating that that's all that you need. Is a basic understanding. That's what rudimentary means, yeah, basic, right? Yeah, yeah. That's all that you need. So with all of those things being illegal that couldn't be able to do, why could you not be able to then uh Because that go was back? that was the reason why he gave on paper. Oh, okay. The real reason why I was denied parole or why he uh snatched my date was 
is that I, there were a number of kites dropped on me while I was on the yard, basically saying that I was a radical Muslim and that oh. I was teaching radical Islam on the yard. All right. I didn't find that out until I got to another prison. Hmm. Right. But that's whether that was his real intention or not, right. what he put on paper as for why you were denied right. was not feasible. Right. And so could you have been able to then go back and be able to say, these are all against, you know, laws that I are written. That. Okay. And then what I happened that. with that? So they, they shot my appeal down. How is that possible? <laughs> I don't that know. Crazy. If we're talking about the law, right? You know wow. what I'm saying? I don't know. Just going off the law, I don't know how they could do it. Right. But wow, they shot my appeal down. So how yeah. long did you serve after you were denied before you went back to the That was 2014. I did five more years after that. Five more years. Yeah. When we, and when did you get out? 2019. 2019. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. That is amazing. Right. And they still try to keep me in there. Like I said, so the- Oh, did you still have problems the, uh, whenever- Yeah. So uh, there, was, there was a number of kites dropped on me while I was in, because I went from Chukawaka to uh, Solano. And uh, the governor set my date when I was in Chukawaka. I didn't find out the reason, the real reason why until I got to Solano, mm. right? But even while I was in Solano, I was kept, uh, went in front of the parole board uh, three times before I got found suitable, right? Every time that they denied me parole was based off of somebody dropping a kite on me, basically saying that I was a radical Muslim, right? And it was these same COs who took my file and sent that file to the FBI, right? So then when the FBI, you know what I'm saying, agent comes to see me, he says, man, I don't know how this file even got to my desk. Wow. He said, clearly, you know what I'm saying? It, he said, clearly, just from me talking to you, I could see the change that Islam has done with your life. Yeah. He said, I don't even know why this is even on, why we, why I'm even here. This is what he told me, right? I don't even know why I'm even here, mm. right? He said, if I can see, you know what I'm saying, the change, right? I'm pretty sure they can see the change, right? And I just told him, I said, man, they just don't want me to get out of prison, all right? Mercy. Right. Mm. Mm. Well, we can't just meet at the table and not share a meal together. So I asked <laughs> James what he would like to eat, and he said something with fish. So I made him a special dish. I'm going to go grab that right now. Okay, so I made James a lemon teriyaki salmon with brown rice and quinoa and asparagus. So go ahead and try it and let me know what you think. All right, thank you. It's good. It came out pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so, James, why don't you tell me, what do you love so much about being a drug and alcohol counselor? Um, Just seeing guys, men and women, who are uh, steeped into their addiction and just watching them and seeing, you know what I'm saying, uh, the this light come on for them like they mm -hmm. want something better for themselves they want something different for themselves mm -hmm. and then actually put in the work to try to get that accomplished that's like the the, the most awesomest feeling in the world yeah just helping people and really i'm not doing anything that's uh like really major right all the thing i'm doing is just giving them information mm -hmm. and then helping them just process that information and a lot of the things that they uh want and desire for themselves it just have to just be brought out right because it's buried by so much traumatic uh trauma. so much trauma yeah. uh so much uh stuff you know the trauma is the beginning of it 
right? What gets us out there in the beginning, but then the stuff that takes place while we're out there, you know what I'm saying? It just gets buried. Mm -hmm. So when they reach down and they find that again, it's just, it's just the best feeling in the world. Mm. Yeah. Were you, were you in, in, um, your times that you were, um, doing the gang life or even incarcerated, were you ever doing drugs at all too? Yes. Okay. Right. So you had yes. addictions as well too. I had addictions, especially alcohol. Okay. Right. And one of the things I come to realize about myself was, is that, um, there was a lot of hurt, a lot of pain that I was experiencing that I was going through. And I covered it up with drugs and alcohol, mm. right? So uh, whenever I was high or drunk, I didn't have to feel those things, mm -hmm. right? Or whenever I committed acts of violence, I just felt better, right? So instead of learning how to uh, identify that emotion and, you know what I'm saying, actually label that emotion, what it is, what is it that I'm feeling? Um, and then learning how to manage that emotion without uh, any uh, negativity, I was never taught those things. So, you know, I just, I knew how to get rid of it. And the best way to get rid of it was to go beat somebody up or, um, uh, get, go get high, go get drunk, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Right. And once I learned, you know what I'm saying, how to properly manage my emotions, right. Um, then I found myself less and less, um, Wanting to reach for those things yes. to, to to bury it down or whatnot. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, James, thank you so much for coming on to this podcast and sharing your story. It's mm -hmm. really been a pleasure. Before we start getting our real grub on, <laughs> um, are there any last uh, remarks or anything that you would like to be able to say? Um, so I have uh, a number of teachers who are still in prison. Um, some of them have come home but i have a, a lot of them that are still in prison and i just want to let you let you brothers know that you know what I'm saying you're not forgotten mm -hmm. you're you know what I'm saying well loved and you know what I'm saying my success is your success mm -hmm. All right. absolutely yeah. thank you so much do you're you welcome. have any uh social media handles or a website or email that people can be able to reach you especially uh -huh. if somebody has a family or a loved one that's suffering from a uh, drug yes. and alcohol so um my social media is all up under my my name, James Merle. Um, whether it's on Facebook or on Instagram, you can find me as James Merle on those. Uh, as far as if you're a family member or even yourself need help with your addiction, uh, you can reach me at 213-388-5423. Uh, That's 213-388-5423. And all you have to do is just call and, and let them know, hey, you know, I seen this guy. He said that if I needed some help, you know, then to call this number and someone will help you, if not myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to encourage you and thank you for all that you're doing for mm -hmm. the community um, with the drug and alcohol counseling and encourage you to actually do the things like you said you wanted to at the park. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't I don't want what city or other people are going to say to discourage mm -hmm. you because I think you have an amazing idea and I think it can uh -huh. really touch and bless uh, more lives than you already are. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just I, I yeah. thank you so much and wish you all the best. Thank you so much for joining us at this episode of Breaking Bread. Make sure to check us in at lockedin.info to see how you can be able to share your story, as well as how you can get involved in helping Anthony Hemphill get resentenced, as well as BPH reform. I'll see you next time on Breaking Bread.